Okay, great. So as we move through the seventh chapter of Yuvamot, we just want to remind ourselves about a couple of verses from Vaikra, from Leviticus, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago, which just deal with the status of the daughter of a priest who marries someone who's not a priest and her ability to eat truma. So while she's in her father's house, while she's in a priestly house, she can eat truma just as her father can. And when she leaves that house, when she marries someone who the, the, the Torah describes as a czar, a foreigner, but in this case, it doesn't mean a foreigner, someone who's not Jewish or someone who's, you know, from another country. It means czar, someone who's not a priest. And the verse says, If a priest's daughter marries uh, a, a foreigner, a non-priest, she may not eat of the holy truma. But the verse goes on to say, But if this priest's daughter becomes a widow or is divorced, and she has no offspring. This is going to be really important in the Mishnayot, which we're going to learn today, and has no offspring. Then she can go back to her father's house as in her youth. She can eat of her father's food. And then the, the verse concludes, No foreigner may eat of it. So the status of this daughter of the priest is that while she's in her father's house, she can eat truma until she's married. And we'll see that she needs to be really properly married to not eat truma. And if she's divorced or widowed and she really has no offspring, she can come back. And the Mishnah is going to play around with the definitions of the, these changes of state. And we've said before that the whole Masechet of Yivamot um, claims to be, or you could say the sticker on the tin is Yibum, which is lever at marriage. But actually what this tractate is doing is putting boundaries or it's, it's not putting boundaries it's defining what marriage is itself so it's a it's a very long tractate it's the longest tractate in the order of nashim and what it is doing is defining essentially what a marriage is and it's doing that via its discussion of boom of leverage marriage but it goes much broader than that and we'll see that as we jump in to the fifth um, the fifth Mishnah of the seventh chapter, which we should now be ready to get into. A rapist or a seducer or someone who lacks mental capacity neither disqualifies someone nor bestows on someone the right to eat truma. So we're talking about now the daughter of a Kohen, or perhaps the reverse situation, the daughter of a Yisrael who marries a Kohen. And the daughter of a Yisrael who marries a Kohen is in, a, in the reverse situation. As soon as she contracts marriage to the Kohen, she can eat truma. She can't eat before. But the Mishnah is going to begin by articulating the principle that, we, that kind of sex is not sufficient to achieve this change of state. So if, if there's a case of rape or a case of seduction or sex, or for that matter, there's a marriage, but someone who doesn't have mental capacity to contract a marriage, these aren't sufficient either to bring uh, the daughter of a Kohen into the house of an Israelite and to stop her eating her father's trimmer, or for that matter, to bring an, a daughter of an Israelite into the house of a Kohen and to allow her to eat truma. We need real marriage to achieve these changes of state. But the Mishnah goes on to say, But if these are people who are unfit to enter the assembly of Israel, so these are effectively forbidden marriages. So, for example, a marriage to a non Jew or a marriage to a mumzer. If these are forbidden marriages, then they do actually 
disqualified. They disqualify uh, the daughter of a Kohen from eating her father's plum. She becomes a, a halala, someone who's a halala is anyway, someone whose status is that she can no longer eat her father's plum. So those are the principles that the Mishnah is now going to explain. And as quite often happens in the Mishnah in Yivamot, the Mishnah articulates a couple of principles and then it just gives some exhaustive and sometimes complex and mind-bending examples to try to illustrate its point. So the Mishnah says, Kate Sad, how does it work? How so? Haya Yisrael Shibar Bat Kohen. So Israelite had had intercourse with the daughter of a Kohen. And we are presuming, by the way, this is not marriage, right? This is not marriage. We're talking about one of these situations with which the Mishnah begins. In other words, it's it's rape, it's seduction, um, perhaps, or perhaps maybe it's a marriage but with someone who lacks mental capacity. It's one of the situations with which the Mishnah begins its discussion. So, Hayah Yisrael Shabbat Bat Kohen. And Israel had intercourse with the daughter of a Kohen. Tuchalbi truma, she can carry on eating truma. In other words, effectively, the Mishnah is saying, look, casual sex doesn't have it, it doesn't have any legal status. It doesn't have any legal status. Ibra Lot Tuchalbi Truma. Now, if she's pregnant, she can no longer eat truma. And we learned in the previous Mishnah that the because inheritance goes through the male line. The existence of this fetus, well, the fetus has indeterminate status. Maybe it's a real person, maybe it's not. In well, we'll see in a minute, it's certainly not the same as a real person, but somehow the existence of that fetus that carries the status of, status of its parent, that does change her status. Ibra lo tuchalbi truma. So she becomes pregnant, she can no longer eat truma in her father's house. If she miscarries, the expression here literally is the fetus is cut up inside her. So the halacha is that if there's a case of arrested labor, so there's a, if you like, there's a live miscarriage going on, there's a case of arrested labor, and we don't, we cannot save the life of the mother except by destroying the fetus. The well, now we're getting into the issue, of course, as to whether a fetus is a real person or not, because we could we could not kill a child to save its mother. But halakha is that you do kill a fetus to save the life of the mother. And in this case, of course, she's well, she doesn't have she's not pregnant. She's not pregnant anymore. So need hatacha uvar bameha. If the fetus was cut up inside her, she may eat. Although she can carry on, she's she's not she's not considered to have been pregnant. It's a miscarriage. Same, by the way, for stillbirth. The Gemara explains she can carry on eating truma from her father's house. What about the opposite situation? So this is a situation where a non-priest had sex with the daughter of Kohen. So now let's flip it round. Hayah Kohen Shiva Abat Israel. Maybe a priest had intercourse with the daughter of an Israelite. Lotuchal be truma. She can't eat truma. So generally speaking, a Kohen marries a, a, um, a Kohen marries a daughter of Israel. She can eat his truma, but not in the case of rape or seduction or um, marriage contracted by someone who's not doesn't have mental capacity. It needs to be a real marriage. It cannot be just casual sex. So she's just, she retains her status as just an ordinary Israelite. Lot tochal be truma, she can't eat truma. Ibra, lot tochal, if she becomes pregnant, she doesn't eat. And we've already learned the fact that the, this fetus has an indeterminate status and it can prevent its mother from eating truma, but it can't permit its mother to eat truma. We discussed this a couple of days ago. Yalda tochal, if she gives birth, to the daughter, to, if she gives birth to the child of a Kohen, then she can eat because the mother, the child, even if it's a, the result of rape or um, seduction, that child is still a Kohen, right? He's the son of a Kohen, so he's a Kohen. And the mother will take her status from the child 
so she can eat truma because of her son. So the Mishnah concludes this section by saying, you know, actually, the, the power of the son is greater than the power of the father because the father's seduction cannot, the, the, the seduction of a priest cannot allow a woman to eat truma, but the birth of a son who's a priest can indeed allow her to eat truma. The power of the son is greater than the power of the father. ben gadol michel of. Let's go on and talk about other types of status. So we've talked about the priest. Let's keep going. Eved, what about a slave? Eved, posel mish. Um, Eved posel mishem bia ve'eno posel mishum zera. A slave disqualifies a woman. This is the same situation. This is someone who can eat truma or could eat truma. A slave disqualifies through sex, but not through offspring. Kate said, how does it work? So now we're going to go through exactly the same examples. But we're going to bring in a slave. But Israel, la kahonu va Israel. So the daughter of Israelite married to a priest, the daughter of a priest married to an Israelite. So they had a child, they had a son. The son goes and he, he has intercourse with a slave, a, a woman who's a slave. And she has a son by him. He's a slave. The the status of the slet, the status of the grandson will go by via his mother. So that the grandson of this of this woman is a slave because he's the offspring of a slave woman. The son went and had intercourse with a slave woman. So she has a grandson now who's a slave. So if his mother's mother. If she, in other words, if if the grandmother in 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 this case, if she was an, an ordinary Israelite married to Kohen, if she's an ordinary Israelite married to Kohen, she can't eat truma. Now we are assuming at this point that her husband and her son have both died. Her husband and her son have both died. She was married to the, she was married to Kohen, but now she takes the status effectively of her grandson. But Kohen li Israel, Tuchal bi Truma, if she was a but Kohen who married an Israel, she can go back to her father's house as long as she doesn't have offspring and the offspring of the the offspring of the slave woman is not considered offspring for this purpose so she can go back effectively to her father's house and eat from mamzer posel umachil a mamzer can make someone dis can disqualify and can also bestow the right to eat and how does it work kate sub we're going to go through the same example but Israel, a Kohen, who Kohen Israel, um, a daughter of Israel married to Kohen, or or a daughter of Kohen married to Israel, the Eldami men are but, and they they had a child, they had a girl child. The the daughter went and got married to a slave. This is a forbidden relationship. At least it's forbidden rabbinically. Then he said la nochri. So maybe she married a slave. Maybe she married someone who was not Jewish. So she married an Israelite or um, a slave and she bought, bought a daughter from him. And he's a mumzer. Now, th by the way, we need to just stop and take a checkpoint at this point. Now, our halakha today, the Gemara does not agree the halakha does not say that this child is a mamzer, but clearly the author of this mishnah holds that this child is a mamzer, and so we need to kind of keep that 
in mind in interpreting the rest of the Mishnah. But the Mishnah contains a lot of opinions which are not halakha, and this is this is this is one of them. This is one of them. I tie all about Israel comment. So let's say her um the, the this mumza's grandmother was the daughter of an Israel married to Kohen, to Khalbi Truma, because she can eat Truma, because she still has the relationship. She still, the Mamzer, doesn't effectively, doesn't do anything to, to break her relationship with the Kohen that she married. Uvat Kohen li Israel, but uh, the daughter of a Kohen who married an Israel, Lotu Khalbi Truma, she still has a status of the husband that she married.